It's Valentine's Day, and what better way to celebrate than by listing out my top 10 best husbandos in a show that I care about, and yet is also regularly disappointed by. The only real rule I gave myself for this was I could only use characters with names, so background NPCs aren't an option. But even then, the list was still kinda tough, cause so many of the guys in Ruby are total asswads, have zero character, or are like... 14. But I still got to 10, so let's jump into the list. Do what makes you happy, children. <laughs> Tyrion is a fun character, being one of the more eccentric ones of the cast. In a world where everyone insists on pretending to be permanently stoic while also talking total garbage, Tyrion is like a breath of fresh air in terms of variety. He's weird and antagonistic while still being surprisingly eloquent. Of course, the immediate flanderization that every Ruby character gets means he's never quite as articulate as his first interaction with the kids. More often than not, Tyrion is just there to giggle a lot and get into Mercury's personal space. Honestly, while I'm fascinated by Tyrion, I also kind of find myself a bit tired of him. He's been doing the same slinking, giggling, crazy shtick for six years now. I'd be delighted to get to see Tyrion be allowed to develop, or if his character was explored more. At the end of the day, while I do like Tyrion in concept, he ends up this slow on the list because he's obsessed with Salem, doesn't get to do much beyond his one gimmick, and is blatantly just a cheap knockoff of Fullmetal Alchemist Brotherhood's Kimberly. And if I gotta choose between one of the coolest, most interesting, and well-written characters, and deviant art crazy, why would I ever pick the scorpion over the sadist? <sighs> Quiet now. Our fancy little bat faunus has always been interesting to me, not for anything he does, but rather because of how the show builds him up for no reason. His initial introduction with the Albane brothers implied that Yuma would be one of the big bads for Blake and her friends to handle while on Menagerie. And then he did literally nothing. He wasn't the one to tie up and fight Blake, that was Miss Who Gives a Crap. He wasn't the one to push Ilya too far and have her turn on the White Fang, that was Fennec and Corsic. He didn't even do anything during the attack on the Belladonna's house. He burst through one window and choked a background character for one second before Kali hit him in the head with a wooden tea tray. And then he like, fucking died, I guess. Really, Yuma probably only got so many lines of dialogue while also acting as integral to the plot as the faceless White Fang members from the end of Volume 1, uh, because they got Lanny Pator to voice him, best known for his work as Vegeta, Piccolo, and other favorites from Dragon Ball Z, Abridged. And in a show where they waste Laura Bailey and Kaiji Tang on characters with little to no lines, I bet they only used Lanny so much because they were able to pay him less than the professional voice actors they work with from Funimation. Regardless of how it happened, what we end up with is basically a blank slate character that you can mold into whatever you want him to be. With nice hair. I'd love to see some cool fan works of Yuma fleshing him out more. Maybe that could help get him up higher into the list. Torchwick hired my boys and I guess he wasn't happy with them. Which is something I can relate to! Junior and his club has always been such a cool idea in my eyes. Melanie and Milsha are such pretty and interesting characters, and the idea of Junior acting as Yang's baby bear equivalent only made the crime lord situation even more interesting. If this is baby bear, how cool would mama and papa bear be? What sorts of bodyguards will they have? Unfortunately, it seems RT wasn't as interested in giving Goldilocks, like, anything to relate to her fairy tale, and I doubt we'll ever get to see the rest of the bear family. But despite that, Junior and all the interesting things one could do with a goofy, runt-of-the-litter crime boss still keeps this minor character lodged inside my brain, which was undoubtedly helped by his card being super OP in the mobile game before it was shut down. Junior and his goons always seem to shine when they're allowed to play, whether it be in the trailers, the games, the manga, or the show. I'd love to see the heroes return to Junior's club to get to see how cool he and his group have gotten over the years while Team Ruby were away. I'm gonna be honest, Sage is only on here cause he's cute. With only one voice line, he's the least explored member of Team Sun, and with Miles blatantly not caring that he couldn't remember what fairy tale Sage was representing when asked once in a Q&A, it seems fair to assume I shouldn't expect to get much more of Sage from the show than we already have. Which really bums me out, cause maybe I'm just a sucker for strong boys who don't wear shirts, but I find him way more interesting than Carrie's self-insert or the excuse to have fans stop crying about how badly they want Gavin to voice a character. Sage is a tough one to talk about for this list because truly he isn't really a character. Mata, the one goat boy from Volume 5, has more characterization than Sage, but I'd love it if we actually did finally get to spend some time with our boy band group, something we've wanted since Artie decided to slap them into the Volume 2 opening for no reason. 
With Team Ruby heading to Vacuo next, there's a decent chance they'll run into Sun's team as they continue their schooling. I'm hoping this allows for not only sick new outfits for the boys, but hopefully also allowing the two team members not deemed important enough to be in Ruby Chibi to get fleshed out a little bit more too. It's done. Another one who's on here basically for the eye candy. While I still think he and any other big blue gins just end up ruining how clever the lamp was, like, come on, look at the guy. He's a total hunk, with the only downside being RT's decision to not give the genies pants means he has to be PG-ified. Fun fact about Ambrosius. Turns out after I made a video explaining how him being based on Merlin was dumb when he should have been the Blue Fairy instead, the Volume 8 commentary revealed that Merlin Daddy was just a placeholder name, but not indicative of his fairy tale. Which is stupid, because one, why would you have a placeholder name that references the wrong fairy tale for a character? And two, the only reason we knew his placeholder name was Merlin Daddy was because Eddie responded with the fact it existed after that Kaito Dan brings up how Ambrosius was likely based on Merlin. So... The writers are full of shit, basically. Either that or they just decided to heavily imply Ambrosius was based on Merlin, but didn't actually give him a fairy tale. That tangent aside, Ambrosius is a fun character. Big himbo energy with a voice like Markiplier after he's digivolved, Ambrosius is just about the only thing in the episode creation that doesn't make me want to tear my eyes out. Perhaps if he had a better reason for existing in the canon, or at least wasn't a dumb half-confirmed fairy tale, I'd have liked him more. But for now, at least I can look forward to him probably pissing off Salem or Cinder in Volume 9. Stay! The only still living Aesop given enough screen time for us to care about, and subsequently also the only one who doesn't get to participate in the finale for Volume 8. Rad use of characters there. And honestly, I bet he's only given so much more screen time than the others for the same reason Yuma got to do so much. Mero is voiced by Mick Lauer, who you probably know better as Rice Pirate, another voice actor who probably doesn't get paid as much as the pros working in Funimation, and so Mero gets to say more since they can afford to keep Mick in the booth longer. While I'd prefer it if Mick got paid well for the good work he does, I'm certainly not complaining that Mero gets to do so much. He's genuinely funny, reacting to the kids' awkward flirting the same way I do, while also having way more to offer than any of his teammates. Being a newbie who's still excitable and a bit naive, while trying to be serious and stoic, is way more interesting than Sassy Girl, or It's Just Ren again. And Mero's double cool, cause when the shit hits the fan, he can fight too. With one of the coolest semblances they've made in the last six years, and one of the few not-just-a-sword weapons of the cast, I wish Mero got to play for the Volume 8 finale, since he's just significantly more interesting than the rest of the Aesops. Really, there's nothing to not love about Mero. He's a delight every time he's on screen. The only thing keeping him from going any higher on the list is the fact that there's early concept art of him where he's got cute dog ears and a braid. And I want those significantly more than the tail and bun we got in canon. Oh well, can't win them all, I guess. You know, we really gotta stop meeting like this. People are gonna talk. Everybody likes Torchwick. We all do. We all thought he was funny and interesting. That's why I'm so upset that his lame-o sidekick has to be forced back into the show, but the interesting, well-established first bad guy of the show doesn't, simply because he's not a cute girl. Hey, Earth to Rooster Teeth, some of your fans like boys. I'd be spending a lot less time in my videos bitching about Neo's inclusion if you catered to my interests too, or would at least stop killing off all my fan service characters. All that aside though, Torchwick was a delight for the short amount of time we had him. He's hammy and silly in a way that makes him fun to watch, even though you're rooting against him. Kinda like Team Rocket. He's just enough of a threat to be an interesting combatant for the girls, while also being enough of a pushover to keep their encounters worry-free. There's a reason Roman's garnered a cult following, and it's not just a vapid ice cream girl has heterochromia reason. Yes, Torchwick looks cool, but he's also a fun character. I like it when Torchwick's on screen, not just because of eye candy, but because of the way he acts. The way he's written is fun. On the topic of eye candy, though, I gotta point out that we really dodged a bullet with Roman. His early concepts were pretty yikes, if you ask me. I'm glad this is the result we got instead. How may, uh... How may I help you? 
This is the level of characterization I'm working with here. A minor character with maybe eight lines of dialogue who dies in the same scene he's introduced is my number three choice on a list of husbandos in the show. I do stand by this choice though, because I think Tuxin is a real delight, and about 90% of that comes from how well Adam Ellis voiced him. It's just a good performance, especially at a time where most of the characters sounded like this. All in favor of becoming the youngest hunter says to single-handedly bring down a corrupt organization conspiring against the Kingdom of Hale. It's hard to explain, but I felt bad when this barely established character died. I wanted to get to see more of him, and still do. There was a lot to offer with Tuxin, from him trying to leave the White Fang, to him being apparently important enough to murder. I mean, in actuality, that whole scene means literally nothing and is foreshadowing nothing. It's just a random series of events to establish our new villains. But I was interested in whatever story they were pretending to set up here. And I don't know, I dig his mad mutton chops. You letting that boy make a fool of you. We're getting to the big guns now, literally. If you've seen my other videos, then there's a chance you already know about my infatuation with our big dumb Hansel. Everything about him is right up my alley. He's jacked, he's got a deep voice, he's a villain but not malicious, he's got cool scars, and best of all, is he can't feel pain. <laughs> But not only is Hazel a total beefcake, he was a fascinating character too. The intrigue of this giant, accompanied by the sound of wind chimes, seemingly so reluctant to participate in any evil, and yet is still one of Salem's main followers. That is such a gripping character. And with how clumsy the dialogue is when he and Ozpin first establish his dead sister Gretchen, it wasn't hard to find oneself pondering on the elaborate past of this rage machine. Unfortunately, Hazel will be forever trapped at number two because in literally every way, volume eight ruined him. A gentle man who looks out for the kids at the castle? Well, now he happily tortures a kid on screen. The potential for hidden mysteries with his sister's death? Nope, she just died and he literally decided to hate Ozpin since he couldn't kill the one actually responsible for her death. Possible redemption arc for this clearly established good person? Nah, he's not a girl, so Hazel's gotta get fucking nuked instead. And on top of how they butchered his writing and character, they totally borked his design too. His hair pulled up into a ponytail looks awful. His outfit is not only way less effective for the cold environment they're now in than the last one, but it just looks dumb too. They couldn't even model his muscles right, making his torso look just... weird. And yet, despite how they massacred my boy in his final volume, he's still number two. Because even after seeing him get so thoroughly ruined, I still love the character we originally got. This Hazel holds a special place in my heart, not just for how handsome he was, but also for how much fun I had contemplating what secrets hid behind his quiet exterior. It's a damn shame Hazel was done so dirty. And now, before we get to number one, let's take a look at some honorable mentions. If they had gone the route of giving Cardin a redemption arc, where he goes from bully to ally, then maybe he could have weaseled his way onto the list. Ty was a strong contender, but I ship him too much with Crow. Mercury would have had a better chance if he had, like, any sort of character. A younger Lionheart would have probably done better than he does now. Clover could have been a contender, but I ship him too much with Crow. Ozpin's too much of a downer despite his top-tier fashion sense. And... That's it. So let's get to the top husbando already. And if that becomes the case, I would think you'd want to be on my good side. Ironwood is perhaps the most well-rounded, well-written character in the whole show. In a world where bad guys think murder is funny and good guys can do no wrong, Ironwood defied all of that by being complex, layered, and allowed to make mistakes. Until, of course, Volume 8. Hazel's not the only one who got fucked over in the latest volume, and I think I've talked about the fall of Ironwood enough, so instead I'd like to focus on the man we had before the writers turned him into a dipshit. He's such an interesting representation of the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. In a story that tends to forget it's got modern technology, Ironwood's metal prosthetics are a sharp reminder of the advancements of Remnant's tech, and also allows for just as much fun contemplation as Hazel's backstory had. How did Ironwood get his robot parts? It's a question that I and many others have had loads of fun pondering or exploring in fan art and fan fiction. The fact that he's sort of like the newest member of Ozpin's crew, as evidenced by how much Crow and Glinda get on his case for not doing things the normal way, adds to this as well. We haven't met Vacuo's headmaster Theodore yet, so we can't know for sure, 
But back in Volume 2, Ironwood struck me as being the youngest of the Headmasters, having a similar naive but trying to be stoic sort of outlook as Marrow. He makes mistakes. He fucks up. But he's also there to help put all the shit back together when the school starts falling apart. He is an interesting and likable character. And with how he helps the girls throughout their mistral adventure, I was excited to see what James could do once he finally had his home field advantage. Not only as a good guy helping the heroes, but as the villain they set him up to become. As Volume 7 progressed, I was having a great time watching the stoic man break, watching him reveal just how fragile he is. I looked forward to seeing him snap. I'm not disappointed that Volume 8 made Ironwood a villain, I'm disappointed that they did it badly. But up to that point, Ironwood had given us some of the smoothest world-building scenes, some real fun character moments with Team Ruby, some good laughs, and one of the best songs from the show, which is probably like 50% of the reason I like the gravity fight so much. Ironwood has given the show a level of quality that's rare to find. This is a top 10 Husbandas list though, not just a top 10 interesting characters list, which means I also get to talk about how cute he is. Look at him! He's perfect! Well, actually, he's pretty flawed. His original outfit is kind of boring, lacking anything particularly unique and with really stupid shoes. His second model has the 10 out of 10 5 o'clock shadow, but also made his arms ludicrously short. And the Atlas arc put him in another pretty boring outfit, not helped by the uniformity between him and the Aesops, which, yes, I know was the point, but it's still boring, and sees him grow out a beard, which took some getting used to. But despite all those flaws, I still love Ironwood. The best husbando isn't just who looks the prettiest, it's who you care about despite not being the prettiest. And even though he sometimes wears dull outfits, and even though he had tiny arms for a bit, and even though his writing went to shit, I still care about Ironwood. The Tin Man may not have a heart, but he can have mine. And there we have it, my top 10 Ruby Husbandos. Like I mentioned earlier, it'd be pretty cool if Rooster Teeth would stop killing them all off. It'd also be pretty swell too if I was given more properly established characters to fawn over. The fact that four out of the 10 fellas on the list are minor background characters should be pretty telling on the level of quality we get out of the male characters in this show. But hey, I still got to 10, and I think it's a pretty fly list if I do say so myself. I hope your Valentine's Day is fun and nominally less depressing than mine. May your husbandos be forever written well, never given a bad redesign, and not be killed off while their female counterpart gets to live. Did someone order a big sausage pizza? I did, but I don't have any money. Why the fuck did you order? God. I gave you a lace parasol! She is just... A tea set! Not that into you. A bracelet! I want to put my face between your boobs! <laughs> well, I mean... Hey, you okay? Yeah, just lately I haven't been able to think straight. Balls. Two guys holding Dick. hands. Dudes, butts. Clay Aiken. Ween